Heritage Center and our wonderful new building. We're so proud of it and we're so appreciative of you being here tonight to support our programs and hear our wonderful author speak. I think I'm gonna sit this off just for just one minute. Um, and, and I hope you will come back because we have a lot of great things going on. You can always look on our website to see, and then we have uh, the paper, usually the, the weekly paper carries our programs as well. So please come back, but enjoy your time here, here tonight as well. And thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, I'm Cassandra King, I think I forgot to, to say that. <coughs> it's my great privilege to introduce our speaker tonight because we really go way, way back I knew your baby when she was a little bitty girl. <laughs> uh, I had the great pleasure of uh, uh, when I married Pat and inheriting some of his friends. You know, sometimes that works out well, sometimes. <laughs> but it certainly, it certainly did in, in my case. And one of his dear friends was Annie River Sims. And so it's almost like Gervais and Curry and Hart and Richard Davis, they were like her grand grandkids, the whole uh, Haggerty family. So I'm just uh, delighted and, and have Gervais and her mother, Barbara, who was her first reader and I'm sure her, her probably her favorite reader. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me tell you a little about uh, Gervais. She, uh, Pat would certainly approve, you'd be so proud of her. I wish you would be here tonight. Um, he, uh, he would certainly approve of how she took the advice, write what you know, and uh, took it to heart in her, in her new book, her first book, In Polite Company, because she writes about Charleston society, and this is from an insider's point of view. Uh, she was raised in this cute little alley behind the famous Rainbow Road in, in South of Rawlinson, Charleston, and uh, now, Gervais sent me this little bo uh, biography thing to read, and I know she said you spent your childhood riding bikes in your fancy drawing room, but I thought y'all skated in there too. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I said, riding bikes, skating, among other things, hunting for pottery shards in, in the backyard. Uh, and something I definitely want to hear more about is a debutante. She was written up, written up for twirling before the seated dinner. So when I first read that, I was thinking, you know, you know twirling batons, maybe flaming batons. And then I tried to picture, did you have on a pretty dress? And I did have on a pretty dress. Twirling like my granddaughter does when she shows up. I want to hear more about her. Uh, and, um, and now Gervais is a, definitely a Southern belle, but she probably uh, would, would fail, of course, because she dropped out of her sorority. <laughs> but then she did graduate from Vanderbilt and went on to get an MBA at the Citadel. So if you go as a graduate student, you, you start to get the hazing. Of course, she doesn't have those stories yet. But she, for a while, explored the West Coast, as a lot of young people do when they first get out of college. But then uh, knew had sense enough to come back to Dallas Country <laughs> and has uh, worked as a producer for uh, new, the news on radio and TV, local radio and TV in Charleston, and taught communications at the Citadel. But now she is happily uh, I'm sure she's happily for her, but especially for us writing uh, full time. So, welcome and thank you for being here. I can't wait to be here. What a crowd! <laughs> I'm so excited. You all, thank you so much for being here. I drove up with my mom earlier and we took a little walk around the town and there's just that beautiful sparkly river, the Beaufort River, is that what we call it? And I was thinking about rivers and the power of, of, of rivers and movement and I was thinking about the power of stories 
and how I get to come here. And I was, I, I was just looking at that, and then it was just, I just kind of felt infused with this idea that I'm in this great river of storytellers, Pat Conroy being the great, and I'm, and I'm here, and I, I'm like a little minnow in this river, riding like a hot pink inner cave, and I'm just so excited to be on it. I'm not one of these like big powerful, but I'm on it, and, and it's such a high, you know, to be here. This, this river, it's, I mean, it's really powered by the heart and soul of a lot of writers and writers that, um, who, have, who have mentored me in some way, even just being in at my periphery growing up, like Anne River Siddons, as you had said, uh, Dorothy Benton Frank, Mary Alice Monroe, Sue Monk Kidd, Cassandra King Conroy. And I'm gonna take a little side note here. I was giving a talk the other day and one of the women said, you only have two names. All Southern writers have three names. <laughs> Why don't you have three names? <laughs> I'm actually Mary Dubay Street, Hagerty, Del Porto. That's just too many. <laughs> but one guy who only got two is Pat Conroy, right? One of, one of the absolute greats. So I really feel like I'm just kind of doggy paddling among this awesome current. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that I'm on this journey and I get to be here with you for a part of it today. So let me tell you a story. I'm going to tell you about how I got here. And a lot of it is the connections through my mother and my connection with Cassandra for bringing me here. And I wanted to start, I got a lot of great blurbs for this book, um, mainly most of the people that I read in that list. But uh, Cassandra's was my favorite. And I'm going to, I'm going to read it. She says, a compelling debut novel that allows us a fascinating glimpse into an elite Southern society trying to hold on to age-old traditions and values in a rapidly changing world. Y'all, I spent probably 25 hours trying to write the copy for the back of this book. And I, next time I'm going to be like, can you just tell me how to sum up my book in a sentence? Stories also have a way of blending with reality right? Like we have family stories, right? And then they get embellished. We have an idea, there's one through story. And so when I was coming together with Cassandra while I was here for the By the River talk and you invited me into your home and we were trying to figure out when did we really connect? When did we get to know each other? And I said, I know, I totally know. It was when Anne River Simmons would fly from Charleston to Maine in the summer and she didn't want to put her beautiful Maine Coon cat through the hassle of freight shipping, you know, just going like just a basic cargo flight. So she got a private jet to fly these cats. And then she said, Barbara, do you want to come along? And then Pat went along too. And this is one of those stories where it became so much of the family lore. I was sure I was on that flight. I was sure of it. And then uh, we were just talking about it. I was like, yes. And that was the summer that I uh, that Princess Diana died. And I was like, that's it. And we all watched her. And then so she's like, no, no, I met him after that. That wasn't it. But what is interesting, and I do want to go back to this, is the power of stories, that river that kind of blends all of us. And uh, does it even matter if I was there or I wasn't there? Like sometimes party, part of uh, these stories become such a part of you that um, that almost becomes not important. And uh, that 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 was it. Just it can kind of change you these different things. So, but our connection, right? Long ago, um, it happened way, way upstream, if you will, and that was in Atlanta. And my mom was there with my dad, and my mom, Barbara Gervais Street, right, another three names, is a writer. And she went around, and I, we were at, we were talking about this on the way up because I hadn't realized that she and I were very similar in our persistence of finding out people we like and we want to be friends. And she thought, I'm going to reach out to what, what magazine was it? Charleston Magazine, and I'm going to see if they'll let me do a story on Pat Conway. And Pat Conway said yes. And that is how they became friends. And what I think is 
really cool and a good way to bring this full circle is to share a really fun little anecdote about this book. So I'm sure a lot of people in the room have read this book. Um, this is my favorite of Pat Carboy's, and I've read it multiple times, but probably it's become more, I'm sure, it has become more dear to my heart because of my time at the Citadel. I was a professor for about seven years, and um, this is my grandfather's Citadel ring, and it's class of 44, which is known as a class that never was. I never got to graduate because of the war. But I, it was, it was such a pleasure to reread this as I was teaching these cadets because they're so mischievous and ridiculous because they're stuck basically in a prison for college <laughs> and they need to find ways to have fun. And, and at the heart of the story, right, there's some really, there's some darker themes here, but, um, but the mischievous snare, that, that, that character of the cadet is still very much alive and that was really, really fun. But the true reason why I always thought this was going to be my favorite book is because there is a character in here with the last name Gervais. You all know this? You might remember. So I want to read a little bit. Um, it's when Will McLean, the, the cadet, he, um, he falls in love with this, with this Charleston girl. And he says, um, you know, I'll come over. As soon as mass is over, I'll be there. There was a groan and she said, oh dear, you're not Catholic, are you ethnic? Oh, of course you are. How tiresome, how predictable. And you're an Anglican, right? I answered, yes. And you belong to St. Michael's? Yes. And you have a Huguenot last name? Yes. And your family belongs to the Yacht Club and the St. Cecilia Society and your mother was in the Junior League and your grandfather fought for the Confederate? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and what is fun is when Pat Conroy was writing this, it was in the early 80s and he was friends with mom and he needed to find a name of uh, like a Charleston name and so he chose that name so it really do it does feel again like this this little part of the river that I'm that I get to travel on and I do I do love sharing that and uh, my connection with the Citadel it has just been um, so fun to kind of deepen my love and admiration for this man that this incredible center is named after. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you who inspired the book, how I wrote it, my journey to publishing, and I'm going to tell you a bit about the story itself. All right, so this book, if you haven't gathered it so far, it's a peek behind the veil of high society in Charleston. So you think pearls, long kids can gloves, cocktail parties, porches, all that great stuff. But it's not all sweet tea and southern charm. There is sex, drugs, and rock and roll in here. Because I'm a little edgy because I wear white after Labor Day, right? So we're just going. Um, yeah, so it's been, it's been an absolute blast. It's mostly a fun book. But I have pursued themes that I'll be talking about that are very important to me. And I'm very grateful for the platform to share some of my views. So I grew up in Charleston kind of like Annie K. Trevay, and as Cassandra had said, behind, behind Rainbow Row. And in that time, I had a great childhood. And a key point in my childhood, a key character, um, one person who I was always very close to is my grandmother. So think about your grandmother for a little bit. Maybe it's your paternal, maybe it's your maternal, Maybe you didn't have a particular blood relative that was really close. Maybe you had, a, my, my editor calls it a bonus grandmother, right? Or somebody who mentored you along the way. And my grandmother, she had a pool, it was on Magree Street. I'm one of seven grandchildren, and we would come over and we would go for swims, and she would put sunscreen on us. And when her cold, her hands were, felt so good when she put the sunscreen on. And at the end, she'd give us ice cream bars and such a happy young childhood. So I always knew I loved my grandmother, but the difference is, is after living away for about a decade from Charleston, I came back and I was an adult and I looked at her through a different lens and I wanted to see her as a person. Who was she? What is she like? What, what sort of decisions has she made? And how was, is her life defined by the time that she was grown up? And I just wanted to get to know her more. I was working at Big Brothers Big Sisters as a volunteer, which you dedicate about one or two hours a week to a kid. 
which is a, like a very noble endeavor, and I really did enjoy it. But when I went to go see my grandmother in her early 80s, I was thinking, you know, I don't have much time with her. What I want to do is dedicate that one to two hours a week to my grandmother, and so that's what I'm going to do. So we went out. I was uh, fresh off a divorce, so I was pretty sad, and she became my date. Um, her her husband, my grandfather, is kind of a crotchety dude. He didn't want to go anywhere. She wouldn't go places, and I liked a guy who played in a bluegrass band. So we went and we drank beer and listened to bluegrass. I also <laughs> took her out to eat sushi. She'd never been, and she's such a lady. And I said, um, Maggie, how does it taste? You know, and she kind of finished her food and looked at me and she's like, well, raw. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she was always up for anything. And I was talking about dancing uh, to some of the people here before this, this talk began, and I love to dance. And one of the last times that um, well, the last time we danced together, the last time we really had a party, each of these events, like at first was over the bridge with the bluegrass place, and it was a nearby restaurant, and then it was just visits to her home. And the last time we were on the porch, her, uh, my grandfather had a great jazz collection, all these beautiful records, but he didn't have a record player. So I bought a record player, and I got an extension cord, and threaded it through the hallway, and we put um, the records in the piazza, and we had this beautiful music, and I danced, I danced with her. And I'll never forget that last dance, how, how magic it was, but also knowing it was definitely going to be the last time because I could feel her getting heavy. Like I could feel she was tired and, um, and that was it. So, so when she passed, I was just heartbroken. I, I just, I, you know, I loved her and I missed her and it was really, really sad. I was working at the Citadel. I had summers off and I was like, I need to find something to help me feel better about this. I started to write, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and the story kind of evolved. And this is a coming of age story. The, the protagonist is 26, and so much of coming of age stories are kind of like, what the hell happened in my 20s, right? I mean, that's so it was that, but it was also just trying to understand, you know, why did you know why does this happen? Why did she go? My beautiful grandmother. I was just, I was just so heartbroken, and uh, eventually, I, I finished the book. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? And at the Citadel, I was a communications professor, but I was also very close with the director of the Career Center. And we, you know, you just kind of hustle, you pinch hit. And I was just known as one of those people who could, as a as a communications professor, I could go and help and deliver a lecture if someone couldn't. And so, at Career Services, this is what they teach at the Citadel. They say you got to do two things. One thing to get your job is you got to work your butt off trying to get as good as you can at whatever skill that is. So for me, that was writing. And two, you got to network. Network, network, network. And it kind of became, again, like I was thinking about mom, like, huh, maybe I'll write an article about that. We can become friends, right? I'm so glad you did, because that's why I'm here, right? And I was thinking the same thing. I had two little kids at home, and I would go to coffee shops. I have a very expensive coffee habit. I will take coffee recommendations for tomorrow morning. <laughs> but I would go there, and I would, I would write, and I was flipping through uh, the city paper. It's a, it's a magazine in town. And I saw a young woman on the cover, and it had her novel on the front, like, you know, Sydney Pike, The Lost Queen. I was like, who is this? How did she get, how did she get on the cover? How did she get this published? I want to know, what, what did she do? And so I read the article, and at the bottom of the article, she thanked Mary Alice Monroe. And I thought, I know her. I am going to pester her. And I did. <laughs> and I pestered her. And I looked back through old emails to make sure I had this right. It was 2018. It was early 2018. And so I sent an email. I sent another email. She responded. She was very lovely. But she's very busy. She's very busy. Um, and I begged her again to kind of ask, you know, and then in 2019, I, I, just, I just started again. I just asked her, asked her, asked her, and she said, you know what? I'll meet you for coffee, bring me your manuscript. And so I drove out to Isla Palms, and I handed her my manuscript. And y'all, this is a really big deal, because I mean, even in my like, little itty bitty time of my just like, I'm bottom of, bottom of the totem pole writer, people still reach out and they want, they want help. So like Mary Alice is getting asked a lot. And to, to, to take a chance, Especially with, with kind of somebody who knows, she knew my mom, like just, it could get sticky. And I just really, really valued that she did that for me. So she, she read it, 
And then she invited me back to her house. And we were sitting at her table, and she was telling me about all these things to fix. And for about 45 minutes, I don't think I breathed. It was like, you know, and finally she goes, oh, but it's good. And I was like, oh, my God, okay. Oh, you think it's good? So I was so thankful for that. But here's the best piece of advice that she gave me. She's like, I really think the, the, the relationship between Simmons, that's the main character, and her grandmother is powerful. It's the most powerful thing that you have in here. But the problem is, Jave, all she does is die. Mm -hmm. Who is she? Why do we care about her? You need to give her a story. And so y'all know Mary Alice loves sea turtles, right? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about a metaphor with Mary, me and Mary Alice. So Mary Alice is like, her advice for me is like full moon, hanging low and bright, you know, <laughs> over the water. And I'm like that little sea turtle, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to do whatever you say. I'm going to work my tail off. <laughs> And so we were talking about a backstory, and I said, my grandmother was a very beautiful woman. And I'm going to take a side note here to talk to you about how beautiful she was. So my, grand my mother here is a poet. She's an award-winning poet. She's a beautiful writer. And she helps me be a better writer because um, she's my first reader on whenever I have a draft. But there is one poem at the family home my grandparents' home that was framed. And it was not written by my mother. It was written by my Aunt Susan, who is not a poet. And the poem goes, some moms have this, and some moms have that, but I've got a mom you can whistle at. <laughs> <laughs> she was a beauty, and so it was very easy to imagine her in her elegant way as a dancer. I was like, I want to make her a dancer. And then Marilla says, great. Give her Capizio shoes. I'm just like, just a little teal, a turtle, like head toward the back. Capizio, Capizio. So I Google Capizio. And the first thing that pops up for me was a little kitten heel and a strap, almost like this shoe. So that's what I imagined. And I didn't even know until, I don't know, a few months ago, the whole time she was telling me was the ballet slipper, which seems way more obvious at this point. But it's just not what I pictured, right? But that's the fun thing about this sort of advice, that she, she has these long-range views of, of how to tell a story, and I'm so grateful for that. So I got, really got to thinking about what is the backstory? Why would people care? And um, that really helped me develop this story. So I want to read a little bit about that um, as I created the character, and her name is Wadi. I wanted to give Wadi a, a backstory, a complicated backstory, because what Wadi was going to do for my main character, Simmons, is to be her guide, to be her mentor, to help her through this time in her life. And that's what so many women and mentors and grandmothers are. They're the, they're the step away, they're that other generation that it's just a little less judgmental, a little more loving. I mean, it's just, I mean, I've got, I've got kids of my own, you know, I'm, and my children are going to have a special relationship with my mom. It's going to be different. Anyway, so this is a line out of there. Lottie is the grandmother and Tito is the grandfather. Don't let her cause you any trouble. That was Lottie's, that's what Lottie's mother warned Tito the day they got married. As family history goes, Lottie was a stubborn girl who didn't take well to authority. She snuck out of Sunday school to go crabbing. When the boy down the street tried to kiss her, she threw rocks at him. One took a chunk out of his cheek. She hid her stockings under the logs in the fireplace and tossed her dolls up in the magnolia trees. Neighbors whispered about the eerie black smoke walking from the chimney. The baby doll eating trees spooked the kids down the block. But the Lottie we know has always been serene. So the question is in the novel, why? What happened? What broke her spirit? And what is she going to tell her granddaughter? How is she going to tell her to be brave? And that is, that's the, that's the thread that wouldn't exist without that mentorship, without that connection. And I do believe probably, you know, she knew Pat, and it's all, it's all part of this, this, you know, this great broad river where I'm that little, you know, men in a hot pink inner tube, and I'm just loving the ride. And, and she really, she really helped me develop that relationship. And, and most of the reviews I've seen, that's, that's people's favorite relationship in the book. How am I doing on time? I know it's a little warm. You're great. So, um, I'm good. Okay. 
So I want to talk about how this was going to be a different title. Originally, I wanted to call it zinnias. <laughs> zinnias are a flower that I love, and the reason why I chose zinnias is my grandmother also planted that flower, and I would help her with it, and then when she was in hospice, I would weed furiously in her garden, just trying to, just getting some control. I wanted to see beauty, I wanted to see life, I wanted to see something that would grow and cultivate and, and reverse the order of what I was seeing in that hospital bed, right? And so I came up with this idea of, of sort of this magical garden. And I like to read beautiful things, and so um, I wanted to share with you this uh, image of this garden that I did. Um, let's see. There's some more out there. I think these are your patients. All right, well, let me wait. Oh, here we go. How many of you have been to Charleston? Probably most people in here, right? So we're in, we're in good company with that. Okay, so this one's a little long, but it's only a page. I won't go too long. So this is when Simmons goes to visit her grandmother. I take a hard left, my wheels crunching the oyster shell driveway, the high porticos rising to my right. I lean my bike against an old crepe myrtle and push the squeaky wrought iron gate that opens into the deep lot behind the house. The grounds are divided into thirds. The section closest to the house is a formal garden with symmetrical paths bordered by low-growing boxwood and accented by giant topiaries. It's a miniature version of Versailles. Behind the garden is a pool, which is nestled into the brick patio like a gem in an antique ring. Finally, far from the view of the house and obscured by a fortress of greenery, aspidistra at the walkway, sago palms at shoulder height, and ancient camellias at the top of this hidden urban canopy is a wild land left for Lottie. In this little outdoor room, fully open to the sun, is a garden of Eden. Are y'all there with me? Okay. Flat leaf hydrangeas grow beneath alligator green ferns. Butterflies lazily sit from patches of hardy milkweed. A ficus vine begins its summertime crawl up the back brick wall. Mint and rosemary hover over our prized treasures, collected through years of beach combing and tucked into flower beds. Whelps, bullseyes, lettered olives, cockles, and blood arc shells. Feathery plumbago leaves shake in the breeze. Lantana petals are scattered over the brick path that leads to the potting shed in the corner. Rim by the greenery, planted in the exact middle of the garden to soak in the high noon sun are the kaleidoscopic zinnias, cherry, canary, margarine, bubblegum grape. I've always known that these plucky flowers with their intense colors and firm stalks are hardworking, but even I am surprised by how they've grown so fast. I'll give my full report to Lottie. So in this book, zinnias represent a wild heart, a rebel girl, it's, I compared it to just, you know, when you're in downtown, you have these beautiful formal English gardens, but they're pruned and they're clipped and they're just, they're just, you know, they're kind of moved and, and molded in a particular way. The zinnias, I mean, they just grow like weeds. Frankly, they do better out of my husband's composted garden bed than they do when I put a lot of time into it in my little flower garden, right? And I love that about zinnias. So that is what I originally wanted to call this book. My editor, who, uh, I got pretty much through Mary Alice, through um, kind of the grapevine there, who also was uh, Cassandra's editor for Tell Me a Story, which is really fun. Uh, but she's a New Yorker, she's a Yankee, and those people tell it like it is. And when I, when she first <laughs> sell the book, um, and it's great, she, 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 saw, she bought it in two days, it was great, but, um, but when she saw the title, she's like, you can't call it Zinnias, you're gonna think it's a gardening book. And I was like, okay, we need to find, you know, a new title. All right, I'll do it. And so I come up with one title. No, I come up with another title. No, I'm like, all right, here's a hundred possible titles because she would just no, 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 and she wouldn't pick one. And at that point, I threatened her. I was like, if you don't pick one soon, I'm gonna call it South of Broad Broads. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so what will you find in the book? You'll definitely get to meet this strong and secretive grandmother. I'll take you into these beautiful historic homes that I've had such a privilege upbringing to be inside. Um, I, like I said, I like to go to beautiful, interesting places. I mean, I want to see the way the light hits a mantle, or you know, the the you know, feel the the bark on the live oak. Like I, I love that sensory stuff, and I and I love bringing people there. But I'm also I'm a daughter of Charleston, and I feel as a, a steward of my city. It is I, I want to to help it in any way that I can, and I am very concerned about sea level rise in our city. And what's interesting about Charleston, about so many new people are there, um, it's just, it, it, it's filled with people who are not from there, and, and it's great, they're bringing new ideas, but what's interesting is they haven't seen the long-term flooding. They don't know that, that it's increased, it wasn't always a problem, and just it, how much worse it's gotten over the years. And I'm a big biker. I ride a cargo bike. I'm gonna have to buy a car for book tour because otherwise Bob's gonna really like disown me at some point. So I'm already <laughs> always buying or borrowing your car. But I have a cargo bike, and I'm on the city's bicycle and pedestrian committee. And I want to be a part of like how do you be a part of trying to bring this city into the new century where we're just like we're not having radical ideas to help save it. And I'm so admire the bluff out there. I mean, you guys are somewhat protected, but like we're gonna be a soup bowl. And the Army Corps of Engineers has this plan um, to have a, it's a eight foot high, 12 mile long seawall around the city. So if you were to go for a walk on the cobblestone streets and try to look at White Point Garden or Waterfront Park, you would not see the water, okay? Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not an engineer, I don't know the answer, but I have learned, especially through Mary Alice Monroe, is telling people about these ideas and maybe there's somebody who has a scientific bet or an engineering mind and i really admire her for doing that with sea turtles with shrimping right it was it's a, it's a great mentor to have and then to bring that into into my novels because that is one point that i'm very very interested in and so my character is as well but the other part i want to talk about is it's a journey of a young woman and when I moved back to Charleston, and when I first started really getting to know my grandmother as an adult, I was going through a major transition. I fell in love with my college sweetheart, he was a great guy, but we just, we, we got divorced, and it was just sad, it was just sad. And so I was back in the dating scene, and he was a lovely man. Um, and I was blindsided by how kind of nasty it is out there. Like, it is ruthless, it is ruthless. <laughs> And as a woman, I was like, what is going on? Like, what century are we in? Like, it just, it, and that's another thing that I want to bring in this book is these, these larger cultural influences. And so I do talk about that in this book. I'm very interested in a lot of the, the good old boy clubs, right? Or um, even in, you know, the boardrooms or even in religion. Y'all know the Smurfs? I know that cartoon. Mm -hmm. And it has how many female characters on it? Just one. It's just got one girl. And I've kind of lately gone around and like, am I in the Smurfs? Like we just, and then what does that do? And then it's better now. We've come a long way. And I'm very, very grateful for the leadership of women for advancing um, the world into a place where I can come here and talk about that sort of stuff. But my grandmother grew up very differently. Right? And so what were those sort of systems that might have stymied her dreams, her passions, right? And then here I am as a, as a mother, right? I've got these two kids and I've had this personal experience you know, going back in the dating world. And I think about my little girls and I think about what they see. I think about the number of, like even just now, even in modern day children's books, like it's vast majority of the characters who do things and say things are male. And so how does that translate to their life and business? How does that translate to their friendships? And more importantly, how does that translate into the bedroom? So as a mother of daughters, my claws are out. They're out. And that is another thing that I'm gonna be sharing with in this book. And I was thinking about that actually when I was reading this little bit from, from Pat's book, how he talks about St. Michael's, Huguenot, Yacht Club, 
Cecilia Society, which is, I know you can only get in through the male line, so we are not in that, right? Okay. Um, but it was so interesting thinking like it is these systems that um, can really put a young woman at a disadvantage. And that is what I'm going to talk about. However, I will say, on the same token, on the other side, I got to be a debutante, right? I totally benefit from the patriarchy. I had a great dad who really took care of us, and I got to do all these lovely things, and yes, he's a member of the Yacht Club, and yes, you know, we're, there is that as well. And so I don't, um, I don't have, again, I don't have the answers, um, but I do have a lot of questions, and uh, one of the goals is to like maybe help start conversations about the balance of power. So those are some of the main themes that come through here, but it's also, it's also fun, right? It's also a good, fun read. So those were the themes that I really wanted to try and um, explore in this novel. Gervais, yes. speaking of the questions, yes. may I let the audience ask you some questions? That's perfect. I was, yes, we can go right to that. Okay. <laughs> Are there any questions? So how long did it take for you to write the book from the time you started conceptually to the time that you published? Mm -hmm. So probably a total of five years. Mm -hmm. I wrote, I started writing when I was still working. Mm -hmm. And um, when my husband, I was like, I really just think I want to do this. And so we built a financial plan so that I'd have a year's worth of my salary saved so they could write full time. And then in case I didn't sell it, I didn't have that financial stress. And at the Citadel, I knew I was a good professor and they would take me back. And so I took that risk, you know, and I still think, you know, they, they, they might, and I loved it. I really loved it there. It was a tough decision to leave, but that, it took a while, but this next one, I hope I can do it in at least, you know, in a year. And you started? Oh yeah, I'm about 200 pages in. And that New Yorker oh, editor, she's great. She'll, she's tough and she'll tell me what works and what doesn't, but I'm a lot, I'm, I'm learning. I'm just learning. I'm learning a lot, and I'm I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for her guidance because she's excellent. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. I, I was wondering um, because uh, when when I read the, <clears throat> the book, um, I tend not to necessarily be drawn to books with young protagonists. Uh, and, you know, I'll pick up a book and it'll look. Uh, interesting on the cover or something I would say 20 year old no, yeah you know something <laughs> and, and go, I'm waiting for you know 70 year olds <laughs> so so I of course identified more with the and the, and the grammar mm -hmm. and, and I wondered about the reception that you had from different age age groups because you do cover that that whole gambit in, in the book, when you see Charleston, you, the, your young uh, protagonist with her bike, you know, yeah. all the going, and she's hip, and she, you know, she surfs, and mm -hmm. all this sort of stuff, is young Charleston to me. Mm -hmm. What I think of, and I, I don't know, but what I think of is young, you know, hip, witted uh, Charleston, but you've got, you've got the other generation. There's such a contrast, and I assume that's deliberate. Yeah, so. I did want to represent the old and the old and new Charleston, absolutely. And so, and I wanted especially the mother character, who's not based on my mother, <laughs> but um, but the the mother character is representative, yeah, of, of of more of the old guard, which is lovely. It really is. I mean, there have been some. I mean, they're lovely people who who it's just this familial type network and I love that community where you can walk into a room and you're probably I know the name of your dog I know you got married to so-and-so and you work at this club and jewelry store or whatever you know I love that about that too so um, someone wrote said it was it's, it's a love letter to the city and I really like that because any love is complicated I mean nobody is perfect right and so I hope it shows the complexities of, of my love for my hometown and, mm -hmm. and the characters who build it well, that was that was one thing I really liked about it too. It's not an an, uh, an expose of you know you're going to read this or so. 
I knew all those rich people in Charleston. It's really snobby and snobby. You know, it's not that at all. It's very educated, complicated, yeah. and loving. And loving. Love, love. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. I see it all over there. Um, it, it's ironic. My nephew was with me today, and he is a Senator Blackwell. Uh -huh. And he and I were talking. I grew up in Charleston. Oh, okay. I've been here since 1982. Okay. But he was saying to me, Aunt Willa, have you noticed you don't hear anybody with a Charleston accent anymore? Why is that? You kind of touched on that, didn't you? That it, it's kind of like this. Carol, what was the word? <laughs> I mean, it's not. I mean. It, it's kind of disappearing yeah. because Charleston is getting so big yeah. and people from off are coming right. and buying right. south abroad. Right. Right. Did, does that bother you? Because it. The problem is, I don't have one either, and I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after a few glasses of wine at the reception, it would have But I do miss that. That is part of, I mean, it's just kind of like this uh, modern, homogenous way that we're living and we're kind of all pinging around. Someone also said it's probably TV, which I don't really watch, but you know, you just kind of hear these more flat affects. But yeah, it's a shame because I, when my audio book, when the audio book was being chosen, and I was a narrator, and I sent him like, this is what a Charleston accent is very particular. Mm -hmm. And I said, you have to, you know, the one that is the easiest to find is Mayor Joe Riley. I mean, that's a legit Charleston <laughs> accent. And my grandfather, this, this ring, you know, he had a few beautiful one. I loved it. I say, you know, I just love listening to his, his voice. And I don't know. I don't know. I, I want to bring it back. It just is not genuine because I don't but have it. You said it was kind of like a culture, really. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, I, think, I don't know if that was the term you used. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they used to marry, you know, yeah. the families would marry right. the same kind of families. Yeah. And, and that's really just kind of disappeared right yeah. now. Yeah. And, um, and you see some of it, though. An interesting thing, again, with these the new people coming in is they don't quite understand that the old guard, they're all still there. And no one ever really leaves, you know? <laughs> I mean, rarely. I mean, it's hard. It's hard unless you live someplace as beautiful as this. But generally, they're just there. But I do know, like, one, I mentioned the Krogans. There's that jewelry store. And a Krogan girl married a hey good boy, which is another. Like, that was one of the big, it was like, they're still doing it. The, the two families, you know, around the corner. Woo you know, it, was, it was just one of the few, a few were in far between. Yeah, because I mean, it was this, the debutantes still happen, right? I mean, it's a lovely party. And again, going back to the patriarchy, like, I mean, it is a, it is a beautiful time when, when the daughters are celebrated. And they're not out there meeting their husbands at the, they're doing it on Tinder or law school, you know? I mean, they're just doing it the way anyone else is, yeah. Yeah, I was just telling Gervais that we were there Sunday, Monday, at our son's house, and he was on um, Sullivan's Island right now. They're building on Pitt Street. Oh, great. In the village. And there's just so many young people, uh -huh. and so many are moving there from out of state. Yeah. But they are already getting their little clicks going. Yeah. It's amazing. But I think really the old Charles Jones are still downtown, the old Charleston area. And yeah, that's what I'm yeah. thinking yeah. because it was just, it was a, a, I mean, it just blew my mind. Like we went to Mount Pleasant Academy to pick up grandchildren. It was young people. It was just, I don't know. It's, yeah, one of the lines in my book is we're strangers in our own land. And it's happening it here like in Hubert too. Yeah. There's so many people moving here. Mm -hmm. We used to know so many people by name. Yeah. And so many new people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I had the pleasure of growing up with Jervo's mother mm -hmm. um, in Barlow, South Carolina, Charleston. And I had the pleasure of knowing Jervo's granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And she was an extremely mm -hmm. beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. I miss her with tears. Um, and she was so beautiful, even as an older lady, mm -hmm. that after my mother passed away, this was a long, long time ago, we lived on East Battery, and I would either walk down the battery every afternoon. My father would walk out on the porch to watch her grandmother walk down the <laughs> And so I just want to say to you, she would be so proud. Oh, she would be so proud. 
He must know his face. What, is, what an image. Yeah. I love that image. It's so great. Well, I know there's wine in the other room. I don't know if you guys um, But I want to say how much of, a, of a, a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for supporting me, um, for coming here. It, 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 it's a dream to come true. So thank you. Thank you all for seeing our next